Just before 3 p.m. in the Maltese countryside of Bidnia, investigative journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia was assassinated only minutes after leaving her home. She had been driving when a car bomb placed under the driver's side of her vehicle detonated. The explosion launched the car 80 meters into an adjacent field, killing her instantly. Daphne had made a name for herself as a journalist and anti-corruption activist. She had built her reputation investigating and exposing Maltese government corruption, nepotism, and links between Malta's online gambling industry and organized crime. She continued to publish articles for decades despite intimidation and lawsuits. And those weren't idle threats by any means. Her house was set on fire twice and three of her family dogs were killed, one of which having its throat slit and its body left at Daphne's doorstep. It seems that whoever wanted her silence was so determined that they planted a bomb under her car, one powerful enough to launch her vehicle 80 meters through the air. To further understand why she was targeted, we first need to go back to 2016, to the leaking of 11.5 million documents. These leaks contained personal financial information on wealthy individuals, corporations, and public officials, exposing a history of systemic involvement in tax evasion, fraud, and money laundering on a global scale. The leaked documents revealed how individuals and corporations from various countries utilized offshore tax havens to conceal their wealth and engage in illicit financing. The documents shed a light on the extent of this global corruption within the economically elite and their acceptance to engage in this practice for financial gain. These leaks would become widely known as the Panama Papers. It's 10 o'clock in the evening and German journalist Bastian Obermeier has just sat down to check his laptop when he receives a rather cryptid text message. Interested in data? Very interested. How much data are we talking about? More than anything you've ever seen. SV, the newspaper Bastian worked for, had published a large number of articles in the last three years covering leaked data on tax evasion and shady offshore dealings. So he knew if a lead was reaching out to him, he'd have to act fast. What I don't think he realized, however, is that he'd just responded to a lead that would lead him to one of the biggest leaks in history, 2.6 terabytes of data on some of the world's most powerful people. But before he could see any of that data, John Doe had a few stipulations. You need to understand how dangerous and sensitive some of this information is. My life is in danger. If my identity is revealed, I've spent the past several weeks considering how to handle this. We will only chat over encrypted channels. No meetings, ever. The choice of stories is obviously up to you. I can live with that. How do we proceed? If you've been keeping up with the news recently, you'd know being a whistleblower isn't the best choice of actions if your goal is longevity. So their desire to remain anonymous isn't exactly surprising, and you'll soon see how it probably saved their life. After following John Doe's demands and continuing their communication through encrypted messages, Bastian received his first batch of leaked documents. The sample had arrived. A big bunch of documents, most of them PDFs. I opened the files on my computer and analyzed them one by one. There are companies' articles of incorporation, contracts, and extracts from databases. It takes me a while to grasp the links between them, but after a quick internet search, I understand the context. The location is Argentina. Jose Maria Capagnoli, a public prosecutor, suspected that shady businessmen had helped the then president of Argentina, Christina Kirchner, and her late husband Nestor to smuggle around $65 million out of the country. What made this stand out to Bastian was that, at the time, there was a litigation case pending involving hedge fund NML Capital and Argentina. After Argentina declared bankruptcy on their debts, most creditors agreed on debt relief strategies, but not NML. You see, they'd bought millions of dollars worth of the Argentinian government's debt, and they wanted return on those investments. The problem NML Capital had run into was a labyrinth of 123 shell corporations making it impossible for them to understand the true financial assets and obligations of Argentina. 
The current goal of the lawsuit was to force the disclosure of this network of shell companies. NML Capital wanted those documents. They'd been chasing them for years. And Bastian now had them in front of him on his screen. During her presidency, Christina Kirchner refused to negotiate and said her country would not pay these vulture funds. Yet, here were documents exposing a litany of corruption during her governance, showing a calculated effort to steal millions of dollars from government contracts. But that wasn't the only document that stood out. Sergio Roldugan. Sergio, the name didn't ring a bell, but after a quick Google search, Bastian was shocked. This man was one of Vladimir Putin's closest friends, family even, being the godfather of Vladimir Putin's oldest daughter. What was confusing though was that Sergio wasn't a businessman or an oligarch. He was a famous cellist. According to the leaks, Roldugan was connected to a group of companies that controlled a significant share of a secret offshore network. Caught outside by reporters in 2014 after one of his performances, Sergio had said, Please, I'm so far from all of this. See, even my cello is secondhand. I'm not a businessman. I don't have millions. Yet, here was his name on documents handling funds upwards of $800 million. In a way, Roald Dugan wasn't lying. He doesn't have millions. He has billions. If this was Putin's wealth, even a fraction of it, this story would make worldwide news. But this was just one of the many world leaders' names attached to hundreds of millions of dollars in offshore accounts. Throughout all these documents Bastian was reading, one name kept appearing. Mossack Fonseca. The interesting thing is that all the documents appear to originate from the same law firm. I'm familiar with Mossack Fonseca, but only ever as an impenetrable wall, a black hole. Some of SV's previous leakers pointed them to Mossack Fonseca, but every time it did, they couldn't get any further information. Right now, you may be wondering what, or rather who, is Mossack Fonseca. They were a law firm based out of Panama, and they were one of the largest providers of anonymous shell companies. And let's just say they weren't exactly picky when it came to their clientele. Now remember when John Doe said that this was more data than Bastian had ever seen? That wasn't an exaggeration. In fact, this was more leaked data than anyone had ever seen up until this point only being surpassed by the Paradise Papers, which were also leaked to Bastion. That is, if you're going off file number. If you're going off data size, then the Pandora Papers win at a staggering 2.94 terabytes of leaked data. This is obviously a lot of information, and far too much for a single person to analyze. Both Bastion and John knew as much. Which is why John urged Bastion to reach out to other news outlets, like the New York Times, Bastian, and by extension SV, didn't have partnerships with New York Times, but they had collaborated with other prominent publications such as the BBC, The Guardian, and The Washington Post. This amount of data demanded an equal caliber of journalists, just to sort through it all, and that's what it got. It began the largest collaboration of investigative journalists up until this point, with a team comprising of around 400 members spanning 80 countries. The sheer scale of the data in this league cannot be understated. With this team's collaboration and the help of the ICIJ, they were able to go through the leaks, with the bulk of the documents being posted on the ICIJ's website. Now, you may be wondering how all of this relates back to Daphne Galizia. Well, let's focus back on her now. Long before the leaking of the Panama Papers, Daphne was already investigating corruption in Malta, but with the leaks, there was even more proof of this corruption. Within these new documents, one of her investigations pointed her sights to former Malta Prime Minister Joseph Muscat. The Panama Papers alleged that Joseph Muscat's wife owned a company under the Mossack Fonseca umbrella called Egrant. But that wasn't the only link between Malta's Prime Minister and Mossack Fonseca. Within his cabinet, Health and Energy Minister Conrad Mizzi and Chief of Staff Keith Shembury were both found to have ties with companies in New Zealand purchased through Mossack Fonseca. These revelations triggered a major political scandal in Malta, leading to widespread calls for accountability and transparency. Caruana Galizia's persistent investigations didn't stop there. She also unknowingly uncovered the involvement of Jorgen Fenech, 
a prominent businessman through his company 17 Black, which was connected to high-ranking government officials including Shembri and Mizzy. Jorgen Fennick was never named in any of Daphne's blog posts, but she had made mentions of his company through its connections to Key Shembri. 17 Black was revealed to be a target client for the Panama companies, allegedly set to funnel illicit funds. The last of her blog posts was just 30 minutes before her death, where Keith Shembury was the subject of her post. The last thing she said before she was assassinated was, There are crooks everywhere you look now. The situation is desperate. December 2017 Shortly after her murder, three men were arrested and charged with planting the bomb on her car and signalling the explosive. George and Alfred De Giorgio and Vincent Muscat. The former has no relation to the former president. July 2018 After a lengthy inquiry that lasted 15 months, Muscat and his wife were cleared of any investigation to Egrant. The inquiry found falsified signatures, differing testimonies and no proof that the prime minister, his wife or their family had any connection with the company. November 2019 Another person of interest is identified as Melvin Thuma, Initially, he was arrested on the 14th of November 2019 as part of a money laundering probe into the illegal betting industry. He wasn't in custody very long before he started talking. The small-time crook claimed he was the middleman in the Caruana Galizia assassination and promised to testify against the mastermind in exchange for immunity from all his crimes. The mastermind, he alleged, was 17 Black's owner Jorgen Fennec. He was granted presidential pardon on the sole authority of the then Prime Minister Joseph Muscat, but the deal came with conditions. Thuma had to reveal everything he knew about the Caruana Galizia assassination, and his testimony had to be corroborated. At the time of his arrest, Thuma was holding an ice cream box filled with a USB stick and a photo of himself with Keith Shembri. November 2019, shortly after his pardon was granted, in the early hours of the morning, Jorgen Fennec was arrested on his yacht allegedly trying to escape the country. Thuma had alleged as far back as 2017, in the months leading up to the 2017 elections. Thuma claims Jorgen Fennec met him and said, I want you to kill Daphne Caruana Galizia. He wanted Thuma to arrange the hit. November 2019 Fennec went on to offer himself as a witness. He promised information about the murder case and other offences in exchange for immunity. However, the request was not granted. Again, 2019 November. An incident was filed against Fennec and he was accused of complicity in the murder of Caruana Galizia. Fennec pled not guilty. Six days after the arrest of Fennec, Keith Shambri resigned his government post as chief of staff and was subsequently questioned by the police. Shembri was later released on police bail. Fennec, in his court statement, accused Shembri of being the mastermind behind the Caruana Galizia murder, in order to frame Christian Cardona as responsible for the murder of Caruana Galizia. January 2020 Joseph Muscat resigns as Prime Minister after mounting pressure over his alleged involvement in the plot to kill Daphne Galizia. July 2020 Thuma was found in his home with multiple self-inflicted stab wounds to his abdomen and neck. Also in July, an inquiry into the car bomb assassination of Daphne singled out the country's former prime minister and his entire cabinet as bearing responsibility for the 2017 murder. While the report did not find proof that the government was directly involved in the murder, it did name former prime minister Joseph Muscat and his cabinet of government ministers as collectively culpable for Daphne Galizia's death through their escalating public conflicts and personal and judicial attacks on the journalist, as well as through the government's failure to provide her with protection against threats. March 2021 Keith Shembri was charged with corruption, fraud, and money laundering. He was denied bail and taken to Caradino Correctional Facility. He was subsequently released on bail after being denied twice. December 2021 Mizzy and Keith Shembri and their immediate family were sanctioned by the United States Department of State, citing involvement in significant corruption. May 2024 Keith Shembri was again charged with, among other things, bribery, 
criminal association and money laundering in relation to Vitals Global Healthcare and the related hospital contract controversy. A lot of the details around Daphne's murder are still unknown, but as of today, the brothers who killed her have been sentenced, Jorgen is still in prison awaiting trial, and many others who are related to the crime are either alleged or being charged with other crimes. So, regardless of whether or not these politicians were involved in Daphne Galizia's murder, they're still corrupt people. To end on a more positive note, I'd like to talk about some of the good things that came about with Daphne's tragic death. Mainly, I'd like to talk about the Daphne Project and the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation. I mentioned earlier that Jorgen was never connected to 17 Black by Daphne herself. However, that came to light after her death. That was in large part due to the Daphne Project. Started by Forbidden Stories, the Daphne Project is a collective cross-borders investigative journalist project by major news organizations from around the world. They initially came together to complete Daphne's investigation and help bring those responsible for her death to justice. To help deter criminals against investigative journalists, Forbidden Stories also have the Safe Box Project. With the Safe Box Network, threatened journalists can secure their sensitive information by sharing it with Forbidden Stories. If they are abducted, imprisoned, or assassinated, Forbidden Stories and its partners can continue their investigations and publish them worldwide. The other organization, the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation, is run by Daphne's husband and her sons, who to this day fight for the truth behind her murder, and for freedom against corruption in Malta. I'll leave a link to both in the description if you're interested in learning more about Daphne and her family's fight. To end this video, I'd like to tell you a quote which I believe perfectly sums up the Panama Papers, and why so many rich and influential people would do so much for monetary gain. How much money is enough? Just one more dollar.